and welcome to this Integrated DNA Technologies webinar on Mikey Guidelines, a roadmap for proper qPCR experimental design and reporting. My name is Dr. Arita Menezes, and I will be serving as moderator for today's presentation. Today we are happy to have a presentation by Professor Stephen Buston. Stephen Buston is currently Professor of Allied Health and Medicine at Anglia Ruskin University in the UK. Professor Buston acquired his first qPCR instrument in 1997 and has published numerous peer-reviewed papers that describe and use this technology. He also wrote and edited the A to Z of quantitative PCR in 2004, universally acknowledged as the qPCR Bible, and more recently the PCR Revolution in 2011. Professor Buston led the international consortium that drew up the MITEI guidelines in 2009 and is in constant demand as a speaker at international QPCR meetings and workshops. Professor Buston's presentation should last about 45 minutes. We will follow the presentation with Professor Buston answering any questions you may have. As attendees, you have been muted, but we encourage you to ask questions or make comments at any time during or after the presentation by typing into the questions box located on the right-hand side of your screen in the GoToWebinar software. At the end of the presentation, I will direct your questions to Professor Barson. In case you need to leave early or want to revisit this webinar, we are recording the presentation and will make the link to the recording available a few days after the presentation on our website at www.idtdna.com under the support tab and on our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash idtdnabio. So let me turn over this webinar to Professor Bassin for his presentation entitled Mikey Guidelines, a Roadmap for Proper QPCR Experimental Design and Reporting. Professor Bassin, it's all yours. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking the time to listen to me talk today. I'm also very grateful to Integrated DNA Technologies for giving me the opportunity to talk. First of all, I would like to emphasize that I have no magic solutions. My aim, however, is going to be to convince you that we have a real problem on our hands with the way qPCR experiments are being performed and perhaps surprise you with the extent of the unreliability of the peer-reviewed literature. There are several problems um, that combine to cause this lack of reliability. It starts with poor assay design, inadequate sample quality assessment, insufficient optimization validation, a lack of proper controls, and an inappropriate data analysis. This is all rolled up into inadequate reporting and therefore ends up in conclusions that are based on unreliable qPCR data. One way of overcoming this, or addressing this at least, is through standardization, which aims to optimize assay design and uh, through extensive optimization and validation and inclusion of controls, get people to the experiments in a way that allows other people to um, to judge and um, see that they've done things the right way. And once you've standardized, you, may be in, you should be able to uh, have more transparency as well. And together, this will allow us to uh, reach conclusions that are based on accessible, reliable qPCR data and accurate reporting. And with a bit of luck, we will be able to improve the quality of all the data that, that, that we receive and, and we produce ourselves. Now, it is actually um, easy, fairly straightforward to produce um, good qPCR, RT-qPCR data, as shown by this experiment here. On the left-hand side, you can see an experiment where um, a student set up five different experiments uh, simultaneously and then simply ran them. And you can see that they're very, very tight in terms of the results. On the right, the same assay was set up on five consecutive days and run on, on, a, on an instrument uh, after five days. And again, you can see that the result is very, very similar to the previous result. So if, if your assay is properly up optimized and if you have green fingers, then you can get reliable results. In this case, uh, the student was, was an Italian student who spent six months in my lab, and um, she really had green fingers. Now, let me digress slightly and uh, suggest to you that the problems with uh, reliability are not confined to qPCR, but that they are also widely um, they're widely causing problems in, in other molecular techniques. And the most obvious one to look at is microarrays. Two articles published in 2011 and 2012, respectively, 
they both deal with very similar subjects. Uh, the uh, identification of expression signatures that identify patients that respond to chemotherapy in, uh, in colorectal cancer. And both papers are published by a Japanese group. The authors come from institutions that overlap, and so even the surgical unit department that, pe that, that uh, supplies the patients is the same. So the suggestion would be that the patient cohorts are very similar. Two things to note. Firstly, not one signature in one paper um, uh, or not one uh, target that was identified in one paper agrees with the, sec with the target from the second paper, which is you know, not uncommon, I think, and uh, uh, not, not doesn't have necessarily surprise us because we know that there are problems with microwave technology. What did surprise me, though, was this, uh, something far simpler than that. Um, the first paper was published in 2011, yet the second paper doesn't even mention um, in its uh, literature review. Um, the references at the end, it doesn't even mention the existence of the first paper, even though these people must be working uh, uh, next to each other. So this is the problem that we face, that a lot of the inf information that is available is not properly presented, is not properly reviewed, and uh, not properly explained. And of course the problem is that the only way we can judge how our research is going is by publishing it. And if then papers are published where people don't report what <laughs> you or I have published, then we all face a problem. Now the, the talk is entitled A Roadmap. I would prefer to think of the various stages uh, that lead from the original thought and through a hypothesis and um, uh, experimental design to uh, hy this hypothesis being rejected or accepted um, as beacons that light up uh, hazards but allow the researcher to steer past them. So it's not a fixed route that we take, but uh, different people will take uh, slightly different uh, courses to, to go past these hazards. And of course, we start off with an idea or for fortuitous discovery that we then try and design experiments to either uh, reject or accept that hypothesis. And the first thing we have to do is design an experiment. And of course, this is where uh, qPCR uh, is supposedly very straightforward because all you need to do is find a couple of primers and uh, a target and um, you will have uh, a result. Now here's a typical example uh, of what I'm talking about. Uh, this paper was hyped quite a lot at the time and what it suggests is that there is a truncated uh, mRNA that can, it, its presence predicts um, the development of metastasis in breast cancer. So an important subject, and if true, uh, uh, significant implications. This is um, the basic detail of the assay itself. As you can see, the authors designed a primer that spans the deleted region, which is grayed out here. So we have a forward primer here and a reverse primer here. So what I always do when I look at a paper to uh, look at how well the assay is designed, I look at the primers and I'll use Primer Blast to do this. And uh, Primer Blast shows up something strange because as you can see here, the forward primer seems to uh, have mismatches at its five prime end. However, if you line this up with the actual sequence, you can see that there is no mismatch here at all. So why is Primer Blast showing this uh, mismatch? The solution is both simple and disconcerting. It turns out that the supposedly deleted part of the mRNA uh, has significant sequence homology with the primer. So the, first, the last 17 bases of the primer are identical, and, and 18 of 19 here are identical. So I would ex expect that this primer is going to amplify both the deleted as well as the, um, the wild type versions of the RNA. So I'm not convinced of the specificity of this primer. The second problem with this assay is that the forward primer is highly structured. As you can see here, we have uh, a stem, uh, the, the, primer, the primer binds to itself and forms this stem structure here, and therefore at, at the leaving temperatures, the internal stem structure here has to compete with the amplicon for binding. And so this would suggest that this primer is probably quite a, um, will, will generate quite an, an, an uh, inefficient assay. The next problem is that if you look at the amplicon, you have this structure here. The, C, the region where the forward primer binds and the region where the reverse primer bind both have stem root structures. 
And you can see that the primal of problems hybridizing to the structure and initiating a PCR reaction, particularly as we've seen the forward primer is already uh, binding to itself. So it has to bind, it has to compete with uh, both it binding to itself and the amplicon forming a secondary structure. So again, further suggestion that this assay is not going to be terribly efficient. Let me show you what happens in real life. This is an example that we found with one of or two of our amplicons. The first amplicon, as you can see, is very clear. Uh, there's no problem at the five prime and the three prime primer binding sites, whereas this amplicon is similar to the previous one in that it has a stem loop structure at either end. If you do a dilution curve, two things to note. Firstly, the R squared value is much better for the uh, structure for the amplicon without a structure. As you can see, the replics are uh, much more all over the place. And uh, equally importantly, the efficiency of amplification is much higher in, in this, uh, for this amplicon here. So if, you are, if this was your reference gene, say, and this was your target gene, then um, if you didn't know about the amplification efficiency, you would have a problem uh, quantifying and getting the relative quantification because you will have differential amplification. And unless you do these kinds of analyses before you start the experiment, you will never know and will end up publishing data that are incorrect. So, so this is a very nice example of how experimental design is absolutely essential and is essential to get it right. And if, as these authors did, they actually published what they did, then at least you can follow up and, and, and make your own decisions or come to your own conclusions as to whether you believe what the authors are concluding. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, um, this information is not available. Professor Bassett, so, can I yes? for a second. Can you just speak a little louder? I think a few of our ah. audience members are having a little okay. The audio is ah. just a little louder. If you could speak, would really help. OK, I shall try. Thank you. <laughs> the next beacon is the data that we produce. And again, taking the previous paper as an example, these are the qPCR data that are published. And as you can see, the fold differences between the um, uh, breast cancer and the metastatic breast cancer is marginal for qPCR. So we're talking about you know, two to four fold differences. So it becomes very important that the authors do their normalization procedures properly and choose properly validated and proper, a proper correct number of reference genes to show this kind of very small difference in uh, mRNA levels. And this brings us to the next peak and then peer reviews. So the peer reviewer has to ensure that the, ref that the reference genes are appropriate, that the assay design is appropriate, and peer review therefore is, is central to understanding and, 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 and making sure that assays are good. So the two questions that are obvious are, firstly, um, what are the PCR efficiencies? And secondly, how did they normalize? If you look at the materials and methods, then it is uh, slightly disconcerting to see, firstly, that they used a 16S ribosomal RNA as a normalization control. And secondly, they used the delta-delta CQ method. If you look at their materials and methods, there's no mention of PCR efficiency. There's no mention of any validation of the um, 18S RNA, and so that causes a problem. Because as uh, Dr. Uh, Van der Zompel showed in his um, presentation a couple of months ago, uh, the way uh, you normalize is crucial to uh, what quality the results that come out of your experiment, uh, what, what the, the, the normalization is crucial for the quality of your data. And in this case, there's a problem because as the ABR user bulletin from 1997 says, if you use delta delta CQ, you must know the efficiency of your target and your gene of uh, your reference gene. And secondly, HNS RNA, a paper published in 2005, shows that uh, a ribosomal RNA is not a good normalization gene. And this is particularly true for cancer, because if you have uh, normal cells and cancer cells, very often cancer cells uh, are more proliferative. And if they're more proliferative, they um, have more ribosomes. If they have more ribosomes, they have more ribosomal RNA. And the link between mRNA and ribosome uh, is such that they are, dis they are, they are uh, transcribed by different RNA polymerases. And in cancer cells, there will be more rib ribosomal RNA as a ratio to a messenger RNA than there is in normal cells. And so your quantification will be unreliable. Unfortunately, 
there is no information provided uh, in the materials and methods about any of this. And so one would have to conclude that based on the fact that the primers don't seem to be specific, that the primers are probably quite inefficient, that the amplicon um, is, has secondary structures going to interfere with the efficiency of the assay, that the normalization has been carried out inappropriately because there's no sign of a PCR efficiency and the normalization uh, gene is probably inappropriate, I would suggest that that publication is not reporting a biologically valid finding. But of course, we don't have the information to be able to say that for certain. Having done the peer review, we end up with a publication. And the, the aim of the publication, of course, is to put our work in the public domain and allow people to judge whether they accept or whether they, whether they reject our, our hypothesis. The problem with placing inappropriate or uh, poorly validated research into the public domain is that once it's there, it's fixed in stone. A paper published last year shows that it doesn't make any difference if a paper it has been re rebutted and probably even retracted. The number of citations that you see, um, that you predict to get, if there had been no rebut rebuttal, is in green. And in blue, you can see the number of citations that you get if if, if, if in the actual citations. And what you can f see very clearly is that for all of these papers, there's no difference between the observed and the predicted citations, meaning that the rebuttals have been totally inconsequential. So once it's published in the peer-reviewed literature, you will typically find that what you, what you will typically find is that if you look for a particular result, you find several papers that say one thing, and there are several papers that say another thing, and it's quite unclear as to which paper uh, is the one we can trust. Finally then, um, independent reproducibility is the next beacon. And this, of course, is, after all, why we have published and why we have told our peers about our research, because we hope that somebody is going to be able to reproduce what we've said, and then, uh, therefore, uh, independently validate our research. Now let me show you what has happened to us when we try to do this. We are interested in a marker called CD133, and CD133 um, was, is, was supposedly a stem cell marker. It probably isn't anymore now, but at the time we thought it might be. And we came across this paper published in a fairly high um, impact factor journal, and it suggested that there were several genes that are differentially expressed in colorectal cancer cells that are either CD133 positive or CD133 negative. So initially this looked quite interesting, but when we looked at the data, at the data more, more, more um, closely, we noticed, um, as you can see here, that the fold difference for microarray experiments and PCR experiments are very similar. Now, the dynamic range of a microarray is much narrower than that of a PCR experiment. So if you have a, a fold difference of a four-fold difference in a microarray, this should really translate to a 30 or 40 or even 50-fold difference in the qPCR. But as you can see very clearly, this isn't the case at all. They're very, very similar. And so, so this, this kind of um, made us uh, somewhat concerned about the, the quality of the data here. So we did what one normally does. We looked at the materials and methods of this paper. And this is the relevant section. And as you can see, uh, there is a mention of real-time PCR, but no more than that. So this paper was published without any information about their RNA quality, about how they prepared their cDNA, what kit they used for their PCR, what primers they used, what chemistry they used, or how they analyzed their data. Absolutely no information whatsoever. And this, of course, is quite typical of qPCR papers. So what we did, we used uh, the Mikey guidelines to design um, uh, several assays to try and reproduce these findings. We transfected uh, three different cell lines with um, anti, uh, sorry, PROM1 siRNA. And as you can see at the RNA level, these are all independent uh, transfections. So these are all biological replicates. So at the RNA level, we've got reasonable knockdown. At the protein level, we got reasonable knockdown. So we were fairly convinced, or we are convinced, that our cell lines um, can be separated into those that express high and no CD133 protein. We used uh, the geometric mean of three reference genes. And as you can see, uh, in all three cell lines, in all experiments, there's uh, no difference between CD133 positive and CD133 negative cells. 
Here, to remind you, is the result that we were trying to reproduce. Two-fold, two-fold, and five-fold differences for these three genes. And here are the results in all the different cell lines. And I think you can see very clearly that there, there's no evidence that um, the genes or the mRNAs uh, implicated in CD133 as CD133 uh, regulated are in any way regulated in our hands at least. We looked at some other genes that have been proposed and we got a very similar result. As you can see, there, there's no real evidence that suggests that there's any differential expression. So, so this is the problem that a lot of us face because we, we read a paper, we, we, we see a result that looks interesting, we look at the data and the data don't necessarily convince us so we then try and look at uh, how the the authors did the experiments and we end up uh, finding that there is no information or no relevant information that would allow us to reproduce the experiment. We then go and design our own experiment and we can't reproduce the data. The question then of course is, well, is it our fault or our problem because we haven't designed the assay correctly, we're doing something different to what the, the other authors did and of course that is all possible. But in, in this particular instance, what, 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 what we feel is that we have designed assays that are appropriate, we have all the proper controls, and so at least using um, our techniques in our cell lines, we can't reproduce these data. Nevertheless, this paper is now in the literature, and uh, if you go and look for CD133 differential regulated genes, you will come across these genes, and if you do not quite know um, as much about qPCRs as some other people perhaps, then you might accept this at face value and, 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 and base some of your research on, on this kind of data. And, and, and that's the problem, of course. Now, in, in, in actual terms, uh, what is happening is that there is an increase in the number of attractions that are occurring. And, and this paper was published last year. And uh, the reason for these retractions is quite interesting because, as you can see here, uh, a, a third of papers are retracted because of scientific mistake. Now, what, what I would suggest is that this scientific mistake um, occurs because authors don't provide the information that allows the reviewer to judge whether the technical part of that paper has been done adequately. And what I can't understand is if, if I as a reviewer don't understand um, a, a technique, I will, I will ask and I will try and get more information. Uh, the problem, of course, is that a lot of reviewers aren't experts in the various techniques that they're reviewing, and so this is how mistakes can creep in. And as, as you could see from the very first paper I showed you, uh, if you have a very basic problem, such as the primer not being specific or the assay not being efficient, then um, you can see how you can easily make a mistake, and um, that then becomes fixed in the literature. Uh, interestingly enough, another publication looked at the number of attractions and compared this to the impact factor of the journal. And perhaps not surprisingly, what you find is that the higher the impact factor, the more the retractions there are. Now, you can argue that this is because higher impact factor journals have more um, research that is more, uh, there's more publicity about that research. And so if it is wrong, it is more likely to be found out. But another reason, as we'll see later, is that uh, in fact the technical uh, level of, of expertise and the, the information that is provided in these high impact factor journals is, is, is very poor indeed. So how reliable then, what, what can we say about the conclusions that are that, uh, of people or papers that are based on qPCR data? Again, I would like to refer you to uh, Joe van der Zompel's talk, which is available on the IDT website, which really gives a very nice um, uh, background overview over why normalization is just such an important part of the qPCR experiment. And here I would like to just show you as an example uh, an experiment that I was uh, confronted with when I gave a talk a few months ago. And, and these were the data that the gentleman showed me. He had been looking at TGF beta and IL-10 in wild type and knockout mice, and he wanted to uh, show, uh, he wanted to show that these genes were in fact differentially regulated. And he showed me his, uh, the first experiment was a reference using cyclophilin as a reference gene that showed no difference. And then he showed me a second experiment where he used HPRT as a reference gene. So you can see very clearly now that uh, if you use this as a single reference gene, you get no difference. Here you do get a difference. So obviously he wanted to choose this. 
So I asked him, well, what did you get for the uh, actual cyclofilin and HPRT? Um, not surprisingly, these are the results. So really, you can't, clearly, you can't use HPRT as a reference gene because it is significantly affected by uh, the treatment. In fact, you have to turn the whole thing around and say, um, you can use the others as reference genes because they're not affected, whereas HPRT is. So whatever is happening is affecting HPRT. But here you can see that the, the problems of using a single reference gene, particularly if it's not unvalidated, if it's not validated. And again, this is nothing new. We published a paper 10 years ago, and uh, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, I would say, what you can see from this figure is, uh, depending on what you decide what result you want before you do the experiment, and then you run your reference genes, then you, and then you can choose the reference gene to give you the result you want to get. Because clearly, if you normalize against um, the tartar binding protein here, you will get a completely different uh, result if then if you say um, normalize against P2 microglobulin or HNS RNA for that matter. So it has been clear for a long time that normalization against single reference genes is not a good idea. And of course in 2002 this landmark paper by Joe van der Zompel uh, suggested uh, uh, an approach as to how one could overcome the um, uh, as problems associated with single reference genes. And that's of course genome and this norm finding on this other other ways of doing it. But 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 the key issue is that one should never rely on the normalization to a single reference gene. Now even today this is not the case however. We published this small paper uh, last year and we just looked at a very small number of papers um, uh, published in Science in 2010 in Cell and in the Biomed uh, Central uh, Journals. And, and we looked at some quality parameters that we feel are essential to allow us to judge the quality of a PCR paper. And this is the sort of thing I would always look at when I look at a RTQ PCR paper in particular. So what we have here is sample quality. And I think those of us working with RNA would uh, not need convincing that it is important to know how good the RNA quality is. But you can see not a single paper in Science or Cell of these 17, 15 respectively looked at RNA quality. Assay optimization, again, um, it is something that people just don't do. Uh, PCR efficiency, most people um, don't look at PCR efficiency. It's slightly better for the BMC journals, but even then, less than 50%. And here's the real problem. Normalization, more than one reference gene, uh, very few people do this. And I like this particular paper that was just been published and uh, it concludes and says that data interpretation is an art rather than a science. And uh, it is an art because um, you, you decide to normalize against a single reference gene and uh, the science stops there, of course, because then you can't really rely on the data in general. Of course, if you have a 100-fold difference in expression of your target gene, then you probably not need to worry about your normalization. And very often, if you're using um, tissue culture cell lines, the same thing applies. You don't need to worry too much about it because um, you've got a very clearly defined uh, set of RNAs and you can have a single reference gene, you may be able to have a single reference gene that is extremely stable. But in general, um, if you're using um, biopsies, if you're using an animal uh, sampled uh, biopsies, then you really need to worry about your reference genes. Now, uh, all this is, of course, uh, well and good. Uh, but does it actually make a difference? Uh, in general, of course, <laughs> most of the work that we do um, uh, doesn't really make a lot of difference, but for some of us it does. And um, I'm not sure whether you know about this, but a few years ago there was a, a, a controversy that involved the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine and a possible connection with autism. And uh, whatever evidence there was, um, there was this paper that was published in 2002. And as you can see, it uses real-time PCR to quantify copy numbers of measles virus, as you can see, from 1 to 300,000 copies. And the conclusions suggest an association between measles virus and gut pathology in autistic children. So this paper, even though the authors never claimed any link, was widely then used to, to, to associate the MMR vaccine with measles virus. And the data I show you, um, I presented um, as an expert witness for the Department of Justice in 2007 in Washington, D.C. Now, what the paper suggests is that a gene dosage correction was always carried out using GAP-DH. In practice, what they did was 
They extracted RNA from intestinal biopsies and checked to see whether cellular RNA was present. And if it wasn't present, that sample was to be discarded and new RNA prepared until they found RNA, cellular RNA, gap DH, and then they would acid that for measles virus. So the SOP very clearly states if there's no gap DH present, that sample is not to be used. So when I was able to analyze their data, because I got access to their actual raw data, this is what I found. In their paper, they report the results from 91 children. And that's what their paper is based on, is the findings from 91 children. However, of those 91, 17 were gap DH negative. So they should have been excluded from the analysis. In a further 19 cases, I could find no evidence of any gap DH ever analysis ever having been carried out. So these were the gap DH was omitted, and again these should have been excluded from the analysis, leaving us with 55 samples. Now of those 55 samples, seven were negative for measles virus, and the further 13 were discordant, i.e., when they used replicates, one was positive and the other was negative. Now clearly, um, when you have a discordant result, you can't choose which is the one you believe. You can't take one and say this is positive and the other one that's negative, no. What you have to do, you obviously have to repeat the assay. What they didn't do was repeat the assay, they used these data. So rather than 91 patients, we now have 35 patients, so a far uh, a smaller sample. The next thing they say in the, uh, in the methods, they used standard curves for the F and H gene. Okay, nothing wrong with that, but here are their standard curves. Here's an example of one of their standard curves. Two things you will notice immediately. Firstly, their unknowns map outside of the range of their standard curve. At best, you would say that you can, your limit of detect a quantification is probably somewhere here between 2,000 and 20,000. The limit of detection, well, these are, it certainly is here somewhere, and these unknowns are outside of the limit of detection. This is not an acceptable standard curve, and certainly not for a diagnostic assay. The second thing you will notice about the standard curve is the slope, which gives a PCR efficiency of 62%. Now, either their pipetting isn't very good, or their assays haven't been optimized. In either case, this is highly problematic for a diagnostic assay. Data analysis, you think, is a rather straightforward thing to do. Well, here's an example of data analysis. Two autistic patients, both classified as positive in their results section. Clearly, the red patient, something is amplifying here because you're getting an amplification plot, but clearly the green patient here is for some reason crossing the threshold, but there's just you can't call this amplification. So what should have happened, of course, is the threshold should have been moved up and this would have caused this one to be positive and this one to be negative. Instead, these data were interpreted as both being positive, and therefore, this is an inappropriate analysis. As far as the RNA was concerned, they used two different types of RNA for the experiments. The first one was fresh frozen biopsies, which is okay, and the second one was formalin fixed biopsies, which is also okay. The problem is you can't compare one to the other, because if you use formalin fixed material, and compare that directly to frozen material, you will always get a much higher CQ because, of course, the Wilson scriptase has problems accessing the formal fixed sample that may be more degraded, it may be cross-linked, and therefore you have a significant difference. Now, here are the results that they produced. First of all, gap DH negative samples gave a result that was identical to frozen material, and that in turn was identical to formal fixed material. Now since by definition the degraded material doesn't have any RNA present, and the formal fixed material should have had a CQ that was much higher than the positive frozen samples, they can't be detecting measles virus here, because in this case there isn't any to start off with, so this must be a contaminant, and in this case it can't have been present at the time of formal fixation, because if it had been, you wouldn't be able to see it. Since it's there, it must have been introduced after the formal fixation process, again suggesting contamination. Again, if you look at their 
methods, you find that they produced standards for their standard curves by cloning the viral genes into bacterial plasmids. Now, this, of course, is always a problem when you're using qPCR because once you have bacterial plasmids around, it's virtually impossible to avoid contamination. So let's look at the actual data. This is what was submitted as evidence. And as you can see, everything is in duplicate here, except for the NTC, which is a single amplification well. Obviously, there could be a problem here because it should be in duplicate. So what's in this well? Once I had access to the data, I was able to look at that well. And here's the result. Well E4, well E4 is the green one, clearly amplified at a very high CQ. But if you look at some of the samples here, then you can see there's a copy number of 9, a copy number of, of, of 74. Um, so the 20, 27 here, so 11 there. So the kind of samples they say are positive are in a similar ballpark as this NTC that was positive. Another example here. Again, everything in duplicate except for the NTC. This looks very suspicious. Open it up. What do you see? Well, in fact, both B11 and B12 are both positive. B12 is, has a much higher CQ, and that's why it had to be excluded, because you couldn't get any of these to be positive if, if this was positive. The threshold was moved up. This one was deleted, and the samples turned positive with a negative NTC. So uh, a misinterpretation and representation of no template controls. And finally, the authors forgot to um, add their reverse inscription enzyme. And as you can see on the left, if you do that with a reference gene, you get a massive increase in the CQ. In fact, these are all CQs of 45. I didn't amplify. On the right, the measles virus gene gives more or less the same result, regardless of whether you use an RT step or not. So this can't be RNA. It has to be DNA. Now, since measles virus doesn't exist as DNA in nature, they and the authors couldn't have been amplifying um, measles virus, and it was clear that they were amplifying probably a plasmid contaminant from their standard they were growing up in the plasmid in bacterial culture. So the shortcomings of this paper then are very clear. The sample had been inappropriately quality controlled. There was clearly no optimization of the assay. NTCs were ignored, and data was analyzed inappropriately. So. So this is the kind of problem that occurs if people don't do the experiments properly. And as I said earlier, in most cases, it doesn't make much difference. But in this case, it has a huge impact because hundreds of millions of, of, of dollars were wasted um, in trying to uh, pursue court cases um, to try and disprove uh, the link between MMR and autism. Thousands of parents uh, and uh, were distressed uh, both in UK and in the United States and, and, and parents were blaming themselves for giving their child the MMR vaccine when they were not at fault at all. So there was untold misery and as far as the UK is concerned, uh, measles is now endemic in the UK and we've even had a, a few deaths. And in parts of London, even today, fewer than 50% of two-year-olds are vaccinated against MMR. So you can see that um, the sort of work we do can have an impact and can have a very negative impact. And that's really why it is so important that we get it right. And you know, I found this so distressing that this is what finally um, drove me to try and push for uh, setting up a set of guidelines that would help people in getting their experiments um, uh, set up and uh, executed and reported in a more coherent and uh, transparent manner. And this is where the Mikey guidelines came in. And um, those of us who do qPCR and RT qPCR experiments know that it's not a simple technique at all. There's a lot of, of, of design involved, particularly if we start from scratch. So we might want to design an assay. Um, in this case, uh, we design an assay using Deakin Design Assay. We have to choose which polymerase we want to use. We have to match it to our chemistry. We want to choose an RT strategy. And then once we've designed our assay, we need to optimize and validate. So there's a lot of steps involved before we even get started on our experiments. Now, some people try and short um, cut this. And um, the idea is that what you do is you purchase an assay, for example, IDT cell, um, ready-made assays, uh, primers and probes. And uh, you buy your kit and uh, just follow the instructions, and uh, there's no problem. Well, 
Firstly, I would say, even if you do this, you really still should validate and optimize because just because the manufacturers have uh, given you a, a product sheet that tells you how an assay behaves, doesn't mean that using your instrument, your RNAs, your, your, your pipetting, and, and your um, kits, you will get the same result. And if you're going to buy um, an assay, and there's in principle nothing wrong with that, then I would urge you to go and look and see what is being offered, because not all vendors are the same. IDT need to be congratulated, because what they do is, they provide primer and probe sequences. Now, in my opinion, it is important to know what your primers and probe sequences are because it allows you to troubleshoot and it allows you to know what you're dealing with. If you have no idea what your primers actually or your primer sequences are, then you're in the dark, really. And uh, so my suggestion would be that if you are going to purchase an assay, look, um, and IDT aren't the only ones, there are others as well, look to see who provides sequences and go with them. Now, sample handling is something that's very important, and uh, many people focus on optimal extraction procedures and optimal uh, quality control for template, and very often forget that how you select your sample in the first place will determine just as much how good your assay is going to be. So this is where laser capture microdissection comes in and cho choosing the right biopsy from the right source. And again, we could spend a, a, a whole seminar on that itself. But uh, always bear in mind that how you select your sample will have direct bearing on the quality of the data. Funny enough, the easiest step these days is the actual carrying out of the experiment itself in the PCR instrument, although there are some differences between instruments. But you have to choose which format you use, and you can use a PCR array and so on. The important point being that you have the appropriate control in place. And finally, how you handle your data, um, from the simplest, which is the Excel spreadsheet, through a sophisticated and extremely useful software such as MultiD and Cubase Plus. Um, you have a statistical um, uh, component as well, and then you end up publishing. Now, because this is such an involved process, the Mikey guidelines have, have, have broken it down into its individual components and produced this checklist, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, which discusses the importance and the relevance in terms of essential and desirable for each of these 80-odd parameters, listing them under the main headings that determine the quality of your PCR experiment. And that's all Mikey really is. It's, it's a guide that, A, allows you to publish complete data, but also allows you to take this as a blueprint for your own assay design. And if you follow this, these guidelines, you know, in, in, in an afternoon or in a couple of hours, in fact, you can design your own assay, and in a couple of in, uh, uh, days or a, a week at most, you can validate that assay. And bear in mind, if you buy the assay, you still need to do all that. So following the initial Mikey paper, we have a Mikey Precy, which is an abbreviated version in BMC, and we now have the primary sequence disclosure, although I would still feel that it's, it's nice to know the primary sequence if you can. The last year has seen a huge increase in the in, in interest in Mikey, and um, this is reflected in the number of citations. We now have nearly at a thousand citations, and as you can see, it's, it's following the PCR um, exponential amplification curve. Uh, Dr. Bachman, so you're up again. Sorry. Yes. yes. I think yes. you may need to uh, I think you may need to unplug and um, plug back your audio. You can't hear me. Yes. Can you just unplug and try it back? Okay. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, that's much better. OK. I, I had to unplug it again. There's obviously something about my system that uh, needs to be unplugged. OK. So, so what I was saying is, can you hear me? Yeah. So what I was saying is that um, the interest in Mikey has, has really led to the point now where um, people have accepted that there is a problem, and more and more people are citing the paper um, in, in their own publications. It has become the most read article in clinical chemistry. And in fact, there are apps available now, uh, one developed by um, Steve Abdel Noor um, for the iPhone um, and for the iPad, for that matter. And so um, there's no excuse, really, for not trying to um, follow the Omaki guidelines, uh, at least to some extent. Let me summarize, then. We start with an idea, and we implement that idea by designing an experiment that tries to convince others that our data 
our that there's something to our hypothesis and they can try and independently reproduce it and then we either reject and carry on or accept the hypothesis and move on with our research. The problem is that I've tried to show, and I've tried to show you this, that there is um, a suggestion that uh, at each stage of, of, of this procedure there's a serious problem with the experimental design, with the actual data and so on. And what, what this res has resulted in is the publication of numerous papers that are reporting results that are totally unreliable. And these have been come fixed in the literature and unfortunately, as I also tried to show you, uh, once a paper is in the literature, it is taken as gospel and people don't question the validity of the data. So Mikey aims to address this by suggesting a very common sense list of, of procedures and um, guidelines that allows people to easily follow and uh, publish data that will give the reader of the publication confidence in the experimental design and so increase the transparency of the experiment. Now I know this is an awful lot to have got through in 45 minutes and that's one of the reasons that I've started this uh, venture where I'm, uh, I've got these basic principles in, in e-books that can be either available as iPad versions or, or, or PDF files and the first two out already, the third one is just about to come out and they really go in, 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 into detail uh, of how to design and carry out PCR experiments properly. And uh, I'd just like to end then with this uh, nice publication that uh, builds on the previous publication from IDT and is available from, from, from their website. So thank you very much for your attention and I uh, hope I have convinced you that there is a problem and also pointed out how we might address the problem and go forward from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Boston, for that very intimate uh, presentation. Professor Boston will now answer your questions. If you have a question and have not done so already, please type it into the questions box located on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we already have quite a few questions, Professor Boston, and uh, many of our audience members are interested in how you went about analyzing your primers uh, in terms of for secondary structure, the softwares you may have used, uh, as well as some of the, uh, you know, every primer can fold and you can get a, de um, a value. So what do you ex consider acceptable or not? Um, okay. Well, well the, the good thing about this is that all the software is freely available online. Um, the mfold website is the ideal website for folding any amplicons and part of that website is something called dynamelt which is uh, just a subsection of that website and that allows you to analyze primers primer combinations primer probe combinations and uh, so what what i will do routinely uh, when i design my own primers but also when i analyze uh, uh, other people's primers i will use this dynamelt to uh, show, to look at the structures I've shown you there. And obviously these are only predictions, but they do uh, give you some information and some, some clues as to how likely it is that a primer is going to have a, a secondary structure. And if you have anything that smacks of um, uh, secondary structure and, uh, and, and internal folding as you saw for the first primer, then you would abandon that assay and, and try something else. Um, you'd, you'd, it is something that you just you develop a sense of what is right and what isn't right, but a good primer would, would show no interaction at all. Uh, 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 an okay primer would show some minimal interaction, and then a poor primer would be typically something like that, although that is actually one of the worst examples I've ever seen. In terms of Amplicon, the M-fold, again, uh, will only obviously uh, uh, give you a, uh, an indication of how a, a, a template will fold. But, uh, and it doesn't always uh, follow that uh, just because there's a potential secondary structure that the assay is poor. But in general what we find is that if there are stem structures at the primer binding site, that assays using that amplicon will be more variable and less efficient. And there's very little you can do to improve the efficiency of that kind of assay. What we typically do is we, we if we find this amplicon, of course before we buy the assay or before we order the oligos, we always do this in silico, we, we would then shift the, um, the amplicon slightly if that is possible and uh, in general we are, one is able to des design an assay 
that is um, uh, easy uh, uh, and uh, uh, efficient. And as I say, the good thing about this is that it's free. Now, um, I also use a software called a Beacon Designer, and, uh, uh, which is an excellent um, commercial software. Uh, and of course, in addition, there are all kinds of websites. And in fact, the IDT website is a really good website because you can design your own assays there as well, and they will do all this secondary structure analysis for you. So um, there's lots and lots of resources available online to make design of primers extremely easy. Um, and I would urge you to just try designing an assay because it is actually quite quite good fun to do and it is fairly straightforward. Yeah, I'd also like to add that uh, actually IDT also has a oligo analyzer tool and uh, within which you can do uh, structural analysis and we also link to Zuka's M4 is use the parameters that he uses as well. So we do have uh, a, a tool on our website also available if you want to manually design a primer and you want to go ahead and check uh, for secondary structure. Um, a lot of questions have also come in regarding what you consider is better to use uh, in terms of material to use for standard curve generation, plasmid DNA or actual sample. Um, we have always used the actual sample. So when we uh, run standard curves, we will use RNA from our uh, uh, actual biological sample. What we do is, it depends, of course, on, on the expression levels of our target. But um, uh, we, we always run standard curves with, with every assay. So if, if our sample expresses at, or if our target is expressed at high levels, we would do tenfold serial dilutions, um, four of those. Um, and if our target expresses at low levels, then we would do five-fold or even two-fold serial dilutions. Um, the important point being that the uh, standard curve um, encompasses and embraces the, uh, the, the CQs that we get for our unknowns. Um, we always use, as I say, RNA, which you dilute into tRNA. And we have never used um, um, DNA or, or plasmid-based um, uh, DNA. What we have done in the past is we have used oligonucleotides, uh, uh, amplicons, for our quantification. Um, the main problem with using an amplicon is that unless you're very careful, uh, you can easily contaminate the whole lab, and then, of course, your assay is, is, is going to become contaminated. So typically what we would do, what we did do was, when the oligonucleotide, oligo oligonucleotide came in from the manufacturer, we would go into a different building and dilute it to lower copy numbers and only ever bring the very high dilutions into the lab. So that, that's the main problem with an oligonucleotide. Um, plasmid DNA, the accuracy of plasmid DNA um, is, is um, well, uh, I think it's, it's a suspect. Also, I'm not comfortable in using an amplified product um, uh, as a standard because once you open an amplified tube, you can't guarantee where the uh, amplicon is going to go, and you, you're more likely to contaminate the laboratory. So um, for, 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 for many reasons, I, I prefer the use of, use of um, RNA for my standards. OK, so in terms of uh, estimating uh, the efficiency of your reaction, uh, first and foremost, what is uh, an acceptable range? And for publication, should your PCR primers be over 90% to be uh, to be valid, to be considered valid? Yeah, uh, that, that's an in interesting point because, again, there's different schools of thought here. Um, we've always taken the view that uh, we should be able to design a very efficient assay. And uh, so we always spend, uh, well, if there's a problem, we always spend a lot of time designing efficient assays. In general, that isn't a problem. Um, sometimes, of course, it is. But in general, I would say that virtually all of our assays are somewhere between 95 and 105%. And we have the odd assay that's at 92%. We've had one that's 85%. And sometimes there's just nothing you can do about that. Um, and so we don't. If, if you really have an assay uh, that, that isn't 95% uh, efficient, we will run a standard curve and simply um, do our uh, quantification with the uh, uh, 85% efficiency, and um, not uh, obviously. It again, it depends on the kind of fold change and, and difference in the copy numbers you're trying to 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 show as significant. But if 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 you have fairly um, significant changes, then it doesn't really matter. 
But um, anything that's less than 80%, I certainly would be worried about. And anything that's more than 120%, I would be even more worried about. Um, so in general, I would say anything between 90 and 110% is probably OK. OK. Uh, so in with regards to multiplexing, and if yes. you're already with a full multiplex with, say, you're trying to assess five genes at the same time, since you yes. have limited samples, what advice would you give to those uh, researchers yeah. who um, the most we have ever successfully amplified has been four uh, samples. We've, we've never managed to get five to work. And even those four samples, uh, the four targets didn't work terribly well. Three worked really well, and the fourth one, we could never get the fourth one to give us the same amplification efficiency. Um, it depends what you're trying to do. We, we tend not to do the same assay over and over again. So in, in, in our situation, it's not worth spending the effort trying to get a multiplex assay to work because the amount of money you save in terms of reagents and so on isn't really that significant because you actually have to add more reagents to get the multiplex to work. Um, however, if, if you're doing a more diagnostic-based assay and uh, you do the same assay over and over again, then it is worth um, investigating um, or investing in, um, in getting it right. Now, there's various... Um, kits, and I, I haven't actually tried any of them, but there's various kits from various manufacturers that uh, promise to simplify or, or improve a multiplexing ability. So the, if, if I was to do a multiplexing experiment, uh, I, would, I would try to see if any of these kits really do what they're supposed to do. And, if they, uh, and then what, we have called, what you have to do is you have to get the amplification efficiencies of the individual assays right, and then hope that when you mix them together, they stay um, at reasonable, acceptable efficiency. As I said, um, the best we got was three, really, and then it started falling apart. But I, ha I have seen assays, um, and uh, if you look at the A to Z, there's a paper published by, by the BIRAT team where they managed to get four or five, I think it was five, actually, five multiplex assays to work. It just depends on, on, on the luck of the draw, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so we've got a lot of questions also in terms of uh, using qPCR for quantitation of RNA-seq libraries, and what is your experience with that? Um, we ha we, I haven't got any we don't, we don't, we don't We haven't done that. We, we can't afford to do that. <laughs> so. <laughs> OK, that, that's fine. Uh, uh, also, in going back to efficiencies, um, there are different ma methods for calculating efficiencies. You can also use just uh, a single curve, right, in terms of the shape of the curve. And yes. what is your yes. What are your thoughts to the different methods uh, in terms of calculating efficiency? Well, I, I, I've never been dogmatic about any of this. Um, I, I believe that um, if, 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 you, if you get a result that makes sense, and uh, if, if you're transparent and, and, and tell people how you uh, arrive at your uh, calculations and at your, at your copy numbers, then it probably doesn't make an awful lot of difference with which method you use. Uh, but just this for, for just since you asked, uh, we, we've always used the standard curve method because um, me being um, mathematically challenged, it was something that I can understand and I can I can actually uh, uh, follow. And uh, the results we have been getting with standard curve based uh, quantification have always been uh, good. Um, we have used uh, the Corbett system, which is kind of a, a second derivative method, and and that also seemed to work. So so I don't I don't think there's anything that's better or worse. I think. The point is, you be consistent. So once you choose to stick with something, then just stay with that. Um, and yeah. um, does it make sense? And if, if if it makes sense, then it should it is okay, I suspect. The problem, of course, is if you get a result that that doesn't make sense, then you might want to use one or two or three different methods that and see whether you get concordance between them, and then work out what the problem might be. Okay. But I think not not to be dogmatic. That's the point I think here. Mm -hmm. And be consistent, right? I mean, use the same method across all your samples. Yes, I mean that, that's obviously essential. That you, you don't you don't chop and change your reagents, you don't chop and change your your uh, way of, of, of analyzing things, and you don't uh, change um, yes your, your your reference genes halfway through. Um, I, I haven't talked about this today, but it's, it's interesting how even even changing a reagent can completely screw up an experiment. So it's never a good idea to to change anything. Uh, until you move on to another experiment. When you start again, doing, start from scratch, uh, don't change once you've started. So that actually brings us to a slightly um, different issue, but uh, FFP samples, um, you know, most of them, not most, yes. but some of them can be in a degraded state. So what is the best strategy? 
for normalizing that? Do the same rules apply? No. <laughs> um, what, what, what we found was that um, we were able to, um, well, it depended what we were doing. Um, if, if we took a, a, a straightforward um, um, formula fixed biopsy, uh, prepare the RNA, and, and we use the um, Agilent or Agilent Stratagene um, uh, FFPE extraction kit. Um, we got reasonable results, and uh, the, the data were comparable um, when we normalized to the reference genes that we had uh, been using for our fresh frozen samples. So, in, in our experience, and um, I stress it's our experience with colorectal cancer samples that have been fixed um, at the Royal London Hospital. Um, we were able to, sh the results we got for formula fixed materials were similar to those we got for um, fresh frozen material. Uh, in fact, we had problems with the fresh frozen material, and that's what we in fact switched to the formula fixed samples. Um, so that, that's the experience I can, I, oh, that's our own experience, but that doesn't mean that that is always the case. Um, so uh, my, uh, the, the answer really is, in our case, yes, we were able to use the same reference genes and the same strategy, and we got the same, more or less the same results. Okay. Um, how about, uh, you know, uh, placement of threshold? Uh, you're doing multiple different runs. Uh, what, should, what should be the guideline on how to compare samples and what the threshold setting should be between different guys um, yeah. as well as different well, places? It depends how we, as I say, we always run standard curves with every assay, so that issue doesn't really arise because we we make sure that we have the same. Uh, we we, not, we 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 quantify against the standard curve of the day, and if you don't have a standard curve, then you probably want to have some calibrator samples and and try and uh, use a threshold that gives you the same CQ for your calibrator samples, or some people just use the same threshold regardless. Now I think that's a slightly dangerous technique to use or tactic to use. And I certainly think that if, if, if you're going to rely entirely on thresholds without any um, standard curves on your sample, on your plate, then you need some kind of a calibrator that allows you to, 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 to uh, adjust your threshold so that at least your calibrator sample gives you the same result each time. And then you can hope that your, your targets will, will be comparable as well. Okay. But um, if, if I was to give you advice, uh, I, I, I would try and use a standard curve on, on each plate. And I know that's not always possible, but that, that's certainly what, what we try and always do. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of questions also with regards to RNA quality. Can you speak more to how you all do it in the lab? What do you recommend? <laughs> okay, yeah. so we, we, we've got another couple of hours, do we? <laughs> 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 um, uh, RNA quality is an incredibly important subject, um, and um, it, is, it is a subject that is, is I, I can't give you an answer in five seconds. What I do know is that um, we, we go through great lengths to make sure that RNA is of, of the highest possible quality. We use an, a RIN, we obviously use the um, we use an Ashton bioanalyzer, and we have used their tape station as well. They both work very well. In addition, we use a 3 prime, 5 prime assay, and we always do an inhibition assay, uh, to uh, a simple dilution assay, to make sure that there are no impurities. Um, in, in terms of uh, RNA quality, the problem is that it isn't straightforward. Just because a sample has a high RIN value doesn't necessarily mean that the particular target that you're looking at isn't degraded. And of course, uh, different mRNAs degrade at different rates, and they also degrade at different rates from five prime, from the three prime end. So it depends very much where your, where your amplicon is situated. In general, qPCR amplicons are very short. So typically, we would design 60 to 70 base pair amplicons. And, and so RNA quality, while it's important, um, the assay is much more robust than they used to be. Um, but uh, in general, our procedure is prepare RNA, uh, do uh, Agilent analysis, do a 3 prime, 5 prime assay. We always design a, uh, uh, two assays, but when we design an assay, we always have two 5 prime, one 3 prime assay, and we do a standard 3 prime, 5 prime, and the dilution assay. We, we published a paper a few years ago on the SPUD assay. What we found is that SPUD is such a good assay that it tends to underestimate the amount of inhibition that you get because it just always works. So in, in principle, I think a dilution assay is the best way of looking at, 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 at uh, sample uh, quality uh, in terms of its purity. But as I say, you know, we, we could spend another seminar just talking about RNA quality. 
Um, and in fact, I'm just writing my, my the, the the third book, which is all about RNA quality, and it's 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 a, it's a minefield, really. How about interplate variability? How do you control yeah. I, I do know that Dr. Van der Sample yeah. also touched on it in his yes. letter. So, uh, just touched so on that. Awesome. Yeah, uh, uh, two, three things. Firstly, listen to his seminar. It's really good. Um, read some of his papers on this because he does explain it uh, very well. Um, but in, in principle, what you, can, you, need, you need calibrators on plates. So you need two or three samples that, um, uh, similar to the threshold uh, question, allows you to compare the CQs for your calibrators between plates. And if you can, if you can get uh, a similar results for your calibrators, then you can be fairly confident that um, your, your plates will be comparable. In, in principle, it's not a problem. So, you know, dr it, um, depending on the number of technical replicates you have and biological replicates, that also end up, ends up determining how many plates you run. So what is your take? on uh, technical replicates and biological replicates. How does one this, determine this, what's the right number? This question came up earlier as well. Um, yeah, uh, we only do technical replicates during our assay development. Once we've got an assay, we never do a technical replicate. We always do biological replicates. So we would do two, ideally three, uh, uh, we take two, ideally three biopsies, uh, take the sample all the way through independently uh, through uh, RNA extraction, uh, the RT, the qPCR step, and then at the end, uh, identify uh, or collect the copy numbers, and then look at the variability, uh, and and then accept or not accept our assay. Uh, and in fact, I've uh, am I still is my screen still showing? Yeah, um, I just you because I had this question because, because I had to question this this morning. Um, I, I I added this slide at the end in case it came up again, and and, and this is what what we find. Um, when we've looked at 56 samples and looked at these target genes here. And as you can see, uh, if, if you do um, the fold change between your replicates, between your biological replicates, then um, you have the median here, which is one, which is what you might expect for perfect replicates. But you can see there's this spread. And so what, what we have decided, what for years we've decided this, or we've done this, we take a plus or minus uh, three, three-fold difference as um, not biologically significant. So we only accept the result when it is outside that range. Okay, and that's based on this experiment we did. So we, we feel there's, I, I, the very first slide I showed you was Sarah's um, PQ, RTQ PCR experiment. If you have a good assay, you will always get the same result. You, you do not need technical replicates. Um, but you, what you do need is to know the variability. And a technical replica tells you how good your pipetting is. A biological replica tells you what the uh, biological variability is that then allows you to decide whether your five-fold uh, uh, change you see in your samples is biologically relevant or simply probably due to um, biological variability. Yeah, another good question that's come up is in terms of when using intercalating dyes, uh, the Melka sometimes can show off shoulder peaks, uh, shoulder peaks. Um, when do they, these be enough of a concern that you need to redesign your primers, and how do you go about uh, assessing uh, the quality yes. of the methods in terms of determining whether you should try a new assay or not? Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's an interesting question because, um, you know, a, a metal curve that's acceptable to me may not be acceptable to you. Uh, in general, uh, melt curves tend to be good. <laughs> um, but sometimes, uh, due to the Amplicon, there are problems. Um, if, there's, if it's GC rich or AT rich, you can get shoulders either side. Um, on, in, in general, as, as long as there's a clearly defined peak and there's no secondary peak, um, um, we, are, we are prepared to accept that as a, as a reasonable melt curve. Obviously, what we do is, if we're worried, we would run it out in a gel and see what we actually see. And ultimately, when we design our assays uh, and, and optimize them, we always sequence the amplicon so that, we are so that we know that our single melt curve corresponds to a particular target. Um, you know, I, I can't give you a, 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 an, an, an overall answer. All I can say is that if, if the melt curve has a single peak, I'm not too worried about uh, a shoulder at either the uh, leading or the trading edge. I just uh, accept it. And what I do get worried about is if, if there is um, uh, uh, an undefined curve or a very broad peak 
or if there seems to be uh, an, a, a, a really bad shoulder, then, then I would redesign the asset. Um, or, in fact, I would try perhaps and uh, change the conditions somewhat. But sometimes you can simply, by simply changing the conditions, uh, some, very many assays ha have a surprising robustness in terms of the um, uh, annealing temperature that you can uh, uh, use for your PCRs. And uh, sometimes you can get rid of, of artifacts by simply increasing uh, the annealing temperature. Uh, all else failing, we always design our amp assays with two or three primers per amplicon, and then we mix and match and um, it's very rare that you come, against, come up against an assay that you can't design an assay against, or a target you can't design an assay against. Uh, and one last, sorry, mm -hmm. one last question. Do my reference gene CQ and my um, test gene CQ have to be similar, or can you have one highly yeah. expressed reference gene and one, you know? Yes, I, yes. Um, I, I hope you're not going to throw the, the, my 2000 review at me, which I, where I said that uh, you should try and, uh, <laughs> uh, but um, no, I think um, we've learned now over the years that because of the dynamic range of the real-time PCR assay, it is perfectly acceptable to have a very high expressing target, a reference gene and a lowish expressing uh, target gene. The main point you want to avoid is having a gene, a, a, a target gene that is expressed at such low levels that uh, you start um, uh, seeing uh, 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 no amplification in some of your in your in your target in, in your in your wells because, uh, say, your Poisson distribution um, suggests that um, there's only one or two or three copies present. That that kind of thing you can't quantify anyway. So we tend to not quantify anything that's less than 50 to 100 copies. So in that case, it doesn't matter. But uh, because of the dynamic range, you can use high and low. Uh, you can mix high and low copy number target and reference genes. Okay. With that, I'd really like to thank Professor Boston. It's been a very informative pre presentation. I've learned a lot. Um, I'd also like to thank all those attending Professor Boston's presentation today. Uh, this is one of a series of webinars IDT will be presenting on qPCR applications as well as other topics. We will email you about these future webinars as they are scheduled. We will also post a recording of this webinar in the next day or two on our website at www.idtdna.com under the support tab and our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash idtdnabio where you will be able to view this and other IDT webinars. Thank you again and the best of success in your research.